yeah, so I'm just going to switch over to my presentation and just to kind of reiterate, uh, feel more than welcome to stop me at any time or interrupt me with any questions. I'm very receptive to that kind of stuff. And also I tend to talk quite quickly. Um, and if you find that it's too fast, just also point that out. I'm okay with that. Okay, so um, I need just to figure out how to share my screen. There we go. Okay, so can everyone kind of see this? Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about my research that I do with the gray seals of Sable Island. Um, so kind of a little bit of what life on the island is like, and then also just a bit of the aspects of what my research entails. Um, a little bit about myself. I have done a few different kinds of projects in marine works. Um, I've worked as an MMO, just a marine mammal observer um, on seismic vessels as well as just small research vessels. I work with the Marine Animal Response Society or MARS, so I conduct a lot of necropsies on large whales and cetaceans as well as respond to strandings and things like that. And I've also worked with FORCE, uh, which is renewable energy studying going on in the Bay of Fundy with um, tidal turbines and things like that. And I started my, I started my work with the gray seals, um, working with accelerometry and telemetry um, in tracking and studying their movements remotely, their movements remotely. And then I moved into more of a physiology-based study for my master's. Um, so my lab has done work for over 30 years on these animals. Uh, we work with all pinnipeds, but we have had specific interests in the Sable Island seals just because of their location and how easy they are to study and all we have to learn from them. Um, so our lab is kind of four or five people at the moment, including my supervisors, Sarah Iverson, who is a lactation specialist. So she works with all kinds of mammals and Don Bowen from DFO who works uh, pretty much exclusively with the Gray Seal and the Gray Seal Project. So this is life on the island. So Sable Island is about 200 kilometers off the coast of Halifax, for those of you who don't know. It's about a 45 kilometer long island, so it kind of looks like a sandbar. And if you've tried to find it on a map, you really need to, to zoom in. Um, but it's held together by roots of the dune grass, which is called marin grass, is what keeps the island together and keeps it from kind of just floating away. It has a very unique history in the sense that there was um, a lot of settlers that came to the island. There used to be a civilization that actually lived there. Um, and then there's a lot of shipwrecks that kind of surround the island and there's a lot of cool history with that as well. It's currently uninhabited except for the research team, uh, which is us, and Parks Canada, which has a rotation of two or three people per year that come that stay on the island. And other than that, it's home to the gray seals and the wild horses that currently inhabit the island. Oh, and this is just like a little quick video of what it's like to land on the island. Um, and there are seals just everywhere. Uh, so camp life is a bit unique. We have two camps for the SEAL team set up. So they are at West Light and East Light. If you can, I don't know if you can see them here on the map, um, but they're at both extremes of the island. It's just easier for the team to kind of split up and tackle the whole island every day instead of starting from one point. Um, so we usually have seven people at West Light. This is the house. We have electricity and sometimes internet as well as indoor plumbing. Uh, and then East Light is kind of like a, unfinished garage uh, with bunk beds and a heated stove. Uh, we kind of alternate where we stay, but uh, that's kind of what life is like. And this is just an aerial shot of what our camp is like at West Light. So we have our house, um, the trailers for all of our ATVs, our generator room, a Quonset hut that needs to be taken down, um, and just quick access to the beach so we can do our research every day. Uh, nightlife, especially on Sable Island, is interesting. There, are, It's home to some of the wildest sunsets I've ever seen. Um, so we go out every day, usually after work, and watch the sunset. But when we turn off our generator, there's it's complete silence on the island. So there's no electricity, there's no light, there's no sound, except for what we call the zombies, uh, which are the seals themselves that tend to make all kinds of scary noises at, noises at night uh, and try to keep you awake. 
And of course, we have interactions every day with the horses. There are about 500 horses left on the island. Um, in the winter, they can be quite chubby and very fluffy. They have this long hair. Um, cameraman that worked with us a few years ago calls them surfer dudes because they have this kind of slow saunter and they just stare at the water all day. <laughs> And I don't really do all that much. Um, but they are a mix of different types of species. So these horses were left behind when civilizations left Sable Island. They, these horses just kind of remained, you know, they weren't taken home or anything. Um, and so they were a mix of ponies and farm horses, as well as really large stallions that used to run the perimeter of the island in search of um, distress signals and shipwrecks. Um, and so they've kind of all um, become sort of one species, but every now and then you get one that's really tall and big and some that are very short and fat. Um, but they are very curious, they're very friendly, they like to come up to you and they're just, yeah, really fun to work with, very peaceful. So Sable is obviously surrounded by water and one of the things that we have to keep in mind every day when we're working is the surf. The, the island itself can be quite narrow when it comes to the dune ridges, so driving seaside can be um, terrifying. Uh, so you, we get drenched every day because of fun waves that just decide to take us out, but you also have to be careful that your ATV doesn't get washed away with you on it. Um, DFO wouldn't be happy and neither would you, I would imagine. Um, but it's just one of those things that on top of all the work we have to do every day, we have to check uh, the tide and make sure that nobody's putting themselves at risk and make sure we're getting home on time because there are whole sections of the island that just disappear uh, when, when the surge, when the waves come up. The other thing to keep in mind is that the sands on Sable are constantly moving, which is one, a problem for our maps because they're almost never right. Uh, because the, the lines of the dunes shift on a weekly basis and it's sometimes hard to find where you were before, especially when you're looking for a single seal that's supposed to be in the same spot. Um, so the other thing that's fun is that um, we get all of these kinds of things that get washed away or kind of come up when the sand moves. So we had this humpback skull that appeared last year. Um, we use it as a mailbox between the two houses at the moment, but you never know how long it's going to stay around. You get the formation of these lakes um, where the seawater kind of washes in over a berm. Uh, so this photo here is just the inside, driving on the inside of the lake. Um, we had this enormous 50 foot wide river show up one day that cut our path <coughs> to the island kind of in half and we had to find a whole different way around that. And then you have, again, like I said before, whole parts of the island that either appear or get completely washed over by the ocean. So sometimes there are just seals you just can't get to, um, but that's part of the fun of Sable is adjusting your map every day and trying to like work around how you're going to get your job done. And of course, with the big with big storms and all the wind and the shifting sands, you get these just structures that sometimes appear out of nowhere. So we had an entire house appear on the side of the dune this year. Um, sometimes you get these parts of boats like masts or just parts of the bulk of the ship that show up from underneath the dune. Um, and parts of that civilization that was left behind. And so you see things like wheelbarrows and God and things that you just can't un understand what they are exactly, but it's always really fun to drive around the island and see what kind of comes up. And like I said, it changes almost on a daily basis, uh, which makes our work really, really interesting. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the island. I know it was kind of quick, but if you guys have any questions, feel free. If not, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce what I do and what my project entails. Actually, I, I have a quick um, question. Sure. Lily, um, I just noticed in one of the pictures, the pictures with the ponies in, there were fences up. Yeah. Um, what, are those kind of historic fences or are they there to keep the horses out of certain areas? Right. <laughs> no, so these fences, they're all around, they're around our camp. Uh, we put them up. Again, almost on a daily basis, the horses really like to come into camp because all of that grass hasn't been eaten, it's completely untouched. Um, and so they really, they really want to get in there, but they also try to tend to scratch up against our satellite dish and 
um, ruin our connection for a week or against the sides of the house, um, which, or against our barbecue and tip it over. So we just put these fences up uh, and make sure that they're, the structures are safe just to kind of keep them away. But they also like to scratch up on the fences, which is what you see this horse doing here is having a nice little butt scratch. <laughs> okay, I have horses, I get that. Yeah, I just, I just wondered whether that was the case. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? How stable are the freshwater resources on Sable? Like I see Wallace Lake and some freshwater ponds there. Um, so most of the, the lakes that you see on Sable, the, the two big ones are actually saltwater. Um, there's a berm on South Beach uh, and when the waves come over, they create these giant lakes of salt water in the winter. Um, but there are two freshwater ponds inside the dunes that the horses rely on for drinking water. They're not very clean, um, but they're there every year. And then they've, they've always been there. Okay. And then we have a, there's a water table under the island, which is how we get our drinking water. Um, it has to be filtered a lot, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's completely, it's uh, very reliable. Every year we've never had an issue. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm just gonna introduce my project. So I'm studying parental investment or parental energy investment in the Great Seals. So what do you guys think this means? Again, yeah? I couldn't find how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, how much you care about raising your baby? Yes, to an extent, yes. <laughs> um, in ecology, we refer to this as how much energy or how much time a parent will put into weaning their offspring. We talk about weaning when the offspring is no longer dependent on the parent for nutrition or other resources. And usually in animals, this refers to uh, provision of food. Um, so looking at, and this, this involves mammals and birds and most animals other than I think reptiles are kind of just uh, tend to be, you know, lay your eggs and kind of go. Uh, but this is usually with, in, in relation to the provision of food and nutrients to the offspring. And I'm specifically studying maternal energy allocation. So this is, uh, so parental, paternal allocation is usually uh, nest building, defense, um, and sometimes just, you know, guarding the young. But uh, maternal energy allocation is largely to do with the provision of food, um, especially when we talk about mammals, because that's when we see lactation and the mom who kind of takes that role on. And this also has, an, it also has, uh, there's differences when we see income and capital breeders with, with respect to parental energy investment. So does everyone know what income and capital breeders are? Nope. Okay, so uh, we have a kind of a spectrum of income and capital breeders where extreme income breeders are on one end and extreme capital breeders are on the other end. And this is about the, um, how the parent uses nutrients during the breeding season. So income breeders constantly intake energy or nutrients during lactation, during birth, and during the breeding season. Whereas capital breeders, especially extreme capital breeders, tend to forage intensively right before the breeding season, and then they fast during the entire breeding season. So there are different mechanisms that we see in parental energy investment that are directly related to if the animal is an income breeder or a capital breeder. So I will go into this in more detail. It's just something to keep in mind. So the mammalian phenomenon is of course lactation. Uh, you guys don't know me, Chad knows me, so he knows that I am obsessed with the concept and the theory behind lactation because it's evolution's perfect process. Um, but it is the ability to transfer nutrients between mother and pup or mother and offspring in the form of milk. So most milk that we see within the animal kingdom is high in sugar, very dilute, so it's kind of a liquid, um, just like the milk that we drink from our mothers and from cows. Uh, but how might these two things be an issue 
for capital breathers who fast, remember, during the lactation period. Storage, like where are they keeping this? What? Sorry, Meg? How can they store enough milk, like storage? storage. Yeah, storage is definitely a problem. Um, the other thing is that sugar is vital in maintaining our neurological system. So an animal who is not having an income of nutrients and is staying for a period of time with their offspring uh, wants to hold on to as much of that sugar as you can because it's what keeps your brain and your nervous system functioning. <clears throat> so how do you think these animals adapt to being have, having to store all of that energy and being able to maintain that sugar that they need to maintain their systems functioning? I'll just go ahead and answer this. Um, so the, the two largest adaptations that we see is that their milk is very high in fat, not sugar. So low in sugar, high in fat and protein. And that also helps to have a shorter lactation period. So these animals tend to stay for their, with their young for a short period of time so they can just kind of pump all that fat out and then go back to feeding so they're able to remain healthy and alive. Um, so the shortest lactation period actually belongs to the hooded seals. So they have a lactation period of three days, but our gray seals are not far behind with a lactation period of about 12 to 15 days, uh, before they return to the sea to forage. I was going to say that the adaptation, I thought it might be that their, their brain doesn't function properly because that's what happened to me when I had my two children. <laughs> You know, I would believe it. Sometimes the decisions that these sales make you makes you question. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna switch a little bit just to introduce pinnipeds and then introduce our study animal. So there are three classes of pinnipeds. Um, those are the Phoses, the Odoriads, and the Odobenidae. So this translates to the true seals, the sea lions, and the walruses. And they're what we call amphibious marine mammals in the sense that they can live <coughs> both in the water and on the land. And they spend pretty much equal amount of time in both. Uh, these animals are coastal. They don't do well <laughs> in open ocean or too far away from the coast because again, like I said, they need that land to land to come up on. And they have some really incredible adaptations to live in the marine environment. So um, these are carnivores. Um, they have this structure in their eye, just for example, called the tapetum which allows them to kind of see in the dark. So when they're diving deep into the water looking for fish or looking for food, um, they're able to kind of see more clearly because of the structure. And if anyone has a dog or cat, and if you've ever seen their eyes in the dark and they kind of glow, it's that structure that, uh, gives, them, um, that or gives them that kind of quality. But on top of that, we see a, a almost square-shaped heart that, and uh, cartilaginous ribs that are able to actually flatten. So when they dive down, they actually become more pancakey um, to avoid getting the bends, as we would call it in scuba diving or nitrogen toxicity. And they also have uh, blood that's all, almost black in color because they have, instead of hemoglobin, they have myoglobin, which allows them to store an abundance more oxygen in their blood system than what hemoglobin would allow. Okay. <laughs> So that's just a little short introduction, just to give you a sense of what we're dealing with. So these animals are pretty extreme already, um, you know, just the lifestyle that they have. And then we're gonna look at two different kinds of pinniped lactation. So first we have the odoriads, which like I said, are the sea lions. These are the cuter, more kind of agile sea of the seals. Uh, they have those external ears and kind of feet-like structures that they're able to walk on. And these animals are almost always income breeders. So the mother will like find a nest for her pup and then go to the ocean to forage and come back and feed the pup. And she'll do this continuously during lactation. So she'll have longer lactation periods. Um, as well, they have a really amazing sense of uh, not sound, like hearing. They have a distinct call between mother and pup that they form when pup is born. And when the mother returns, she's actually able to correctly identify her pup among hundreds of pups um, based on that call sound and their, um, their, the smell that the pup gives off, which is pretty cool, just a little side. 
phosids are different. So phosids are the true seals. These um, are the kind of more sausage looking of the two. And instead of being agile, they kind of just um, are not. But the phocids are largely capital breeders. So again, we see that extreme end where most of the phocids are, they fast during lactation, very short lactation periods, and they're able to pump out a lot of milk and a lot of fat in a very short amount of time. So looking at the Sable Island gray seals, um, sorry, I am jumping around a lot, but do you guys have any questions just on the background in what I've said about lactation? And I'm just going to move into our study species, but any questions? <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to assume this is all okay because I'm going to jump back into it um, in a minute and hopefully this will all come together. But we, why do you think it is beneficial for us to study these seals specifically? It might be um, part of the puzzle of addressing the questions about interactions between the gray seals on Sable and um, fisheries resources, and not just on Sable, maybe other places too. Yes. <laughs> that is one thought. <laughs> it's not my particular area of study, so I try not to mention it too much, uh, but it is definitely one of the reasons we're on Sable. Uh, but largely it's because there are so many seals in this one spot and they return to it. So these, uh, this is the largest breeding colony of gray seals on the planet. It's comprised of about almost 400,000 individuals. That number has been growing pretty steadily over the past few years, but we're finally starting to see it kind of level off as the animals reach K. So, and this, is, they, this colony comprises 85% of pup production in the North Atlantic. So most of these, the, spe the pups in this species are born on sable and return to sable. Okay. So they have a really high site fidelity, which is why they're also really good uh, model animals for things like telemetry, because you're very likely to get your instruments back uh, because 99% of our seals return to the island every year for the breeding season. And they are capital breeders. Now, the reason that we focus on this is because since they are not taking in any nutrients during lactation, we can actually study the process of lactation between mother and pup almost entirely on the weight differences between when they arrive and when they leave the island. Does that make sense? So instead of having to use kind of tricky instruments and be more invasive, we can just take a weight measurement um, and over the weight gain of the pup and the weight loss of the mom, we're able to kind of quantify this maternal energy allocation that we've been interested in. So these are the gray seals, Halicorus gripus. They have a very distinct appearance. They are the horse-shaped or the horse-faced seals because they have that abrupt nose. Um, most seals have kind of like a dog face where you see that curve uh, and these animals kind of have more of that kind of horse nose. They are large bodies and sexually dimorphic. So this means that there's a distinct difference between the males and the female seals. Uh, females weighing in around 280 kilos between like, we usually see between 200 and 280 kilos. Males weighing in at almost like 400 kilos. Uh, large, large animals. There is little to no parental care in, these, in this species. So males have no role in the pup's life. They're just kind of there for mating and then they go on their way. Uh, and like I said, females will spend kind of 15 days during lactation and then she will, she will leave and the pup will stay behind on the island. And so yeah, here we see maternal allocation only where the, parental, the, the, parent, the paternal has no a huge role in weaning of the pup, and it's kind of all down to the mom and health of the mom. And they have a very interesting lactation period. So gray seal lactation. Females arrive on the island around five days before parturition or before giving birth. Um, and in this time, they usually you can see them moving around a lot, trying to find that one perfect spot to give birth. And this is where I talk about them not making super wise decisions. They're not very social animals. They don't like to be around each other, but they all really like the North Beach, which is the smallest of the two beaches. So on one beach, we see a very large amount of seals crowded together. And then South Beach is almost completely empty. Um, who knows? 
And then they have, like I said, around a 15 day lactation period. And this can be up to only nine days if she is a first time mother um, and up to 21 days, uh, I think we have recorded in our current data set. And there's no, int no intake of nutrients over this time, just like I said. Moms will lose around 90 kilos of weight during the entire process uh, through milk output and also maintenance of her body. And pups will gain around 60 to 65 kilos uh, during this time. I'm just gonna show you what this looked like. So the photo of this pup, this is a newborn or almost newborn. They weigh in between 12 and 16 kilos at birth. And this is a pup at weaning, weighing, this one weighed in around 70 kilos. Um, so you can just kind of see that huge intake of milk and what that does for the pup in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, and I always try to reiterate this because I know not everybody is a lactation uh, fiend, but uh, this is an incredible process to gain that much weight and to be able to transfer that much weight uh, successfully in a very short amount of time. It's just incredible. So two weeks? Two weeks? Yeah, two weeks. Wild. I also need a question from Brittany answered in the chat. How do you weigh them? How do we weigh them? I'm actually about, I'm going to show you, uh, but essentially with a capture net system that I will explain in a minute. So excited. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So post weaning, this is what we see. The pups will lose their uh, lanugo, which is that white kind of uh, very, very thick fur that we see on the pups to keep them warm as uh, when they're newborns. And then they'll spend two to four weeks alone on the island. Um, so mom leaves, and this is just the time they spend until they're able to kind of get their courage up to go into the ocean and learn how to forage for themselves. Um, and this is a very fun process to see pups kind of diving into the ponds and into the ocean for the first time and then running back to safety <laughs> um, and learning them to see how to use their fins is very, very cute. And in this time, they depend entirely on those fat stores that they, they got from their mother during lactation. So it's very important that she gives as much as she's able to uh, because the pup survival pretty much depends on it. Um, sorry, and they lose a lot of weight very quickly in this time. So once we see that weaning kind of peak, they start to lose weight very rapidly because like I said, they're on their own for like two to four weeks. Um, and eventually they learn to swim and forage and they go off and uh, come back a year later as first years. So previous work on the island has involved uh, milk composition. So what exactly is in the milk? And this is how we were able to identify that the steel milk is primarily fat uh, and protein, almost 60% fat towards the end of lactation, um, which is almost solid for those of you that want that visual. Um, we studied the predictors of milk output, so how much milk will a mom put out during lactation based on her weight, based on her age, things like that. Uh, we've done between species comparisons, so comparing these capital breeders to other capital breeders or to other pinnipeds. Um, composition changes during lactation, so like I said before, the fat percent is about 60% during lactation, at the end of lactation, but it starts off around 40, so it's just kind of seeing how carbohydrates and sugars and proteins and fat content changes. And then predictors of energy, maternal energy allocations is what I'm looking at. So when I, the idea of my project is to get, if I see a mom and I know certain aspects about her, will I be able to predict the quality of pup that she will produce and kind of what goes into this good mother, bad mother theory. So gathering data on table, there are four main projects that we do and four main projects that we focus on gathering data. The first and most important is brand reciting. This is done once a week. So our uh, life history animals are branded. Um, so they have a letter number combination um, on their body. And they, I think we do branding around every five years and we only brand those animals whose mothers were branded. So what's really cool is that we have these animals and we know their entire maternal history. Um, including, you know, her, the mom, the grandmother, what ages they died, how, what quality of pups they produce, et cetera, which is a very unique opportunity. And it also the way that we study population changes on the island by kind of just doing a simple calculation of how many branded animals we see back every year and how that population is changing. We do what we call the circuit. 
I'm on the circuit team every year and I'm not biased in saying that it is the best team to be on, on Sable. And this is just checking in on the pups. So because we don't know exactly what day weaning is gonna end, we have to check on those mother pup pairs every day so that we're able to weigh the pup at weaning because like I said, they lose weight very quickly, which just means that this is the team that gets to interact with pups, which is really fun. Uh, we work on the life history project, just collecting different kinds of information, including age, parity, things like that from the mom, and then photogrammetry, which was another aspect of my project, which I'm going to talk a bit about in a little bit. So brand reciting, we set out every day, we're looking for animals that have brands on them. So you can see this female on her butt has an NY, this is our New York lady. Um, and so you, we drive around on our ATVs for hours at a time. And you're just kind of weaving your way through these 400,000 animals, trying to find the branded animals, writing them down, and then we look for them every day. When you find a pregnant female or a female with a pup, we just dye them pink because uh, finding a pink seal is much easier to find than a gray seal, almost thousands of gray seals. So the circuit is slightly different. We get a map that looks like this where we have all of our animals um, on the map. And so you'll have all of the IDs that we're looking for and we'll just drive around looking for those locations. And that's where when the map changes, things get kind of tricky because you really need to find those animals. Um, so you just find them, they're usually in a pair like this, you re-dye them if they're white or not dyed like that. But the day that you see the pup alone is the day that you go in and weigh. So when the mother, mother's still around, that pup is not weaned. When the pup, you see the pup alone, the mother is likely gone and you go in and do the weighing. So what we do is we use a bar net scale system. So we just catch the pup in the net. We attach a hanging scale to it and we lift it on our shoulders. Um, if you're short like me, I usually need to like stand on my bike or something to be able to get it high enough. It's really, it's quite difficult because like I said, these pups can weigh up to 70 kilos um, and they're not always super uh, calm. They move around a lot, uh, but that's how we get our weight estimate. And then we just make sure to uh, get the weight of the net, obviously, so that our data, but that's how we weigh pups. Life history data revolves around the mother. So this is weighing the females. So we do five total measurements of our female pup pairs and we weigh them day three and day 12 for moms, day three, day 12 and at weaning for pups. So like I said, with pups, we do a hanging scale system, but for mothers, we have to use this kind of tripod winch system where we will catch the mom in a larger net, which is a struggle all on its own. Um, once the net is secure, um, we'll just get her length measurement. We give her and we administer five cc's of diazepam, um, usually helps calm them down and keep them still, Wait, like wears off in about 10 minutes. Um, and then we attach this kind of winch system and just kind of lever them up until we're, we have them off the ground and we're able to get a weight measurement. Um, and then we just release them and we stick around to make sure that the mother and pup are not disturbed while she's still a little dopey and that uh, make sure that they're, re they're, re they're reunited correctly. Um, but yeah, it's pretty quick. It's a quick system if it goes well, but it can take up to an hour if you have a pesky animal. So why do you think we wait until day three to go in and weigh? If these pups start gaining weight as quickly as I've said, and they gain so much weight per day, why would we wait all the way till day three to get our first measurement, do you think? Less drama for the pup. And what? And the mother maybe postpartum, maybe they want to do some bonding, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. So uh, you need to give them time to bond, especially you need to give the mother time to become very familiar with her pup scent so that she is able to recognize her pup. Uh, if they go in a little too early, uh, there, are, there have been instances uh, way previous and when the study was just starting up um, where the mother pup pair had, they had difficulties with reuniting them because the mother will not recognize her own pup. So you wanna give them at least three days to kind of bond and become familiar with each other before you're putting your scent in between them kind of thing. And lastly, why do you think we include day 12? Why do you think we didn't just do day three and weaning? 
why do we go in on day 12? Maybe you want to know whether it's a linear progression or whether it's a curvilinear progression? <laughs> kind of, with the pups for sure, but with the moms, it's mostly because we don't see the moms again. So they will leave and they're gone. So we want to try to get an estimate on how much mass she loses, because like I said, that's a big stepping stone in how we figure out our maternal energy allocation. Uh, so you want to make sure you're able to get to her before she hits the water kind of thing. Okay. Answer. So there are some issues with these methods. Oh, sorry, do you have a question? <laughs> no, I just, Chad had an answer in the chat. I don't know if you see the pop-ups when they come oh. up. But, um, no, I don't. I can't see them when I'm sharing, I don't think. Sometimes people write things in the chat, just letting you know. Okay, yeah, if you want to, I can't see them during when I'm sharing, but you're, if you want to yell them at me, that's fine. I will yell, no problem. <laughs> uh, Chad thinks that you weigh them on day 12 because it's right before weaning. No worries, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Really close, Chad. Really close. Good effort. Um, <laughs> oh my so, god, I didn't mean to shame him. That was all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. We're, we're good friends. He'll be fine. <laughs> um, so there are some issues with these methods of data collection that I've just specified. Do you have any ideas what they may be? I had one pop up there by accident, so you might have seen it. Um, it, it's time consuming. Um, <laughs> sorry, Chad. <laughs> um, it is time consuming. So like I said, it can be a quick process, sometimes up to an hour, but when you have about 200 animals that you want to measure, there's no way you're going to get to all of them within a single breeding season. So it's not as lenient time-wise as we would like. You need a lot of manpower. Females, like I said, weigh almost 300 kilos. Uh, this requires a catcher, three people to kind of hold her down, people to hold down the tripod, somebody to weigh, like kind of like rotate her up. So you need like at least five to seven people from your team distracted from other projects, focusing on just capturing and weighing females. Uh, there is a little bit of stress on the animal, not enough significantly. We've done a few studies before to really alter their behavior anyway, but we want to make sure that we're as non-invasive with our study as we are uh, and it is an invasive procedure because we do have to go in and interact with them and take up part of their day um, and you have a risk to researchers so like i said these animals are really big and they're very aggressive they don't like each other and they especially don't like us and they have very big teeth um, so you do put researchers a little bit at risk if something goes wrong you know we hope for the best we haven't had any serious injuries but it, it can be um, a tricky process Amelia, is there ever the risk of like any like missing data because you can't find the pup again or the mom? Yeah. Or? Um, Sable gets hit by storms every day almost. Um, so missing pups is always an issue. We always have pups that leave, moms that leave. Uh, we have this thing called pup switching where moms will switch pups for some reason. Um, and every now and then you do see adoption, so you have these weird cases of data that just like are incomplete or weird or you just can't use them. But yeah, it's a tricky process. <laughs> um, well, do you think there are any alternatives to our data collection, given all of these kind of flaws? Um, are there any alternatives to the way we could collect data? So this is where my chapter comes in, talking about photogrammetry, which I mentioned earlier on. So photogrammetry is the theory that you can estimate the volume or size of an object through a series of photographs and computer algorithms. Um, so this has been used a lot on animals that are a very large size or they're in a habitat like the ocean uh, that is difficult to kind of uh, get a good measurement in or to kind of interfere on. So essentially what we do is that we lay these 3D reference objects um, around the animal. The first year they were buoys, this year they were squares because they're just easier to map. And then you take a series of photos from different elevations around the animal to try to get a good 3D image of what the animal looks like. But there are potential problems with photogrammetry. So it seems really great in theory because it would help us kind of tackle those issues I mentioned before. It's less time consuming. You only need one or two people. You can do it from a distance. There's no stress for the animal and there's a lot less stress to the researcher. 
but what might be some issues to making this project successful, do you think? Cost of software? It is one. The software and the camera are both very expensive. Uh, so yeah. What about estimation there? Like there'd, there'd be a relation between volume and um, weight, but uh, maybe it depends to some extent on the state of the health of the animal or? Yeah, you wanna make sure that the way you're estimating is as accurate as possible, especially if that animal doesn't have the right like shape or if she's a little underfed and doesn't have the right uh, kind of rotundness that we're aiming for, might be a bit tricky. Other things about these animals is that they dig what we call seal holes, where they just kind of keep burrowing into the sand. Um, and this kind of project has been done a lot before on animals that are on flat surfaces, so ice or rocks, where their entire weight kind of ends up splayed out in the image. But for our seals, there's always the risk that part of her body is hidden in kind of this little hole and that we're missing some estimation there. The other thing is that these animals are constantly moving. They're constantly aggressive. They will not sit still. Um, so in our pilot project, when we're administering diazepam, it's less of an issue uh, because that animal is just kind of lies still. But when they are disturbed, and especially more than once, uh, they'll start to move around. Those animals always want to face you. They never want to have their back to you. So once, once you shift position, she'll likely follow. Um, so that's been an issue we're dealing with. And the last issue is that these animals have what we call an S-shaped vertebrae in their neck. And this gives them the ability to extend their neck almost a meter outwards, which is one, dangerous when you're walking near them. That's why you always carry a stick. Um, but it's kind of their lunge uh, reflex that they have for foraging and they also use it to attack. And if that S, if that neck isn't fully extended in the photo, then again, you're going to be underestimating the mass because it's not all going to be splayed out there. Any questions on that? Okay. So the last thing I'll say about Sable is that it's really fun to arrive on. The work is amazing. You spend a lot of time just away from your life. You know, there's no internet, there's nothing to do but read and work. But leaving Sable can be tricky um, because once that leg fills in, we really can't get the twin pilot to land. So our only exit option is through helicopter, but helicopters don't like storms. And like I've said, it storms on Sable almost every day. So there have been times that we, we get out early because we know there's a storm coming, but there have been times that we've been delayed two or three weeks more than we wanted. Um, always an adventure. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my kind of wrapping up on what I do on Sable and the aspects of my project. Quick video of what it's like to leave the island. Any questions? It was fantastic. Thank you, Millie. Um, it was a really great overview. Your research is fantastic. Um, yeah, oh, Megan says she has to go, but amazing job. Very nice. Um, yeah, I would then open up the floor for discussion. I, I had a question. Um, Millie, you said at the beginning of the talk that 85% of the North Atlantic population of gray seals pop on Sable Island. Do you know how far afield they they come from? You know, is that um, right our there? North Atlantic population? They kind of tend to spray out. There's some on like Cape Cod main area, and there are some on the shore of kind of Bay of Fundy, uh, Cape Breton, and then there's a few that kind of go all the way up to Newfoundland, I believe. Right. Thank you. That's great. Well, Um, I have a question. Um, that was a really fun talk. Thank you so much. It was very interesting to learn more about what it's like to even live on Sable. Thank you. <laughs> every, every little Nova Scotian girl's dream. <laughs> um, so my question is related to that data set you had on lineage. Like you're talking about like you have mothers and like offspring like yep. branded over the years. Um, I was wondering if the data set is extensive enough that you could somehow do fecundity studies. So like for instance, like if, you know, a mom loses more or less weight, if they have more or less pups. 
Yeah, um, that's definitely something that somebody is working on. Cool. Uh, I think one of the PSU students in Alaska is uh, working on something similar. I'm also trying to conduct a study on, there's moms that obviously get repeated in the data set. It's a 30 year data set. So there's lots of moms that are measured several times. Um, so trying to do a version of a kind of fecundity study within individual females to see if there's a, a, a role of individuality that kind of plays into uh, the lactation process. Cool, thank you. Great questions. Oh, I don't know what I've done. Oh, I just, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I know I'm always like, well, we, you know, because that usually we have these seminars in person and we would just, you know, chat and have coffee and stuff but um yeah I'm much more persuasive in person uh, yeah but no, you really I think you just did such a great job thoroughly answering all the questions and painted such a picture of like what life is like there it was yeah just like Brittany said every little girl, Nova Scotian girl's dream love to see it <laughs> so, yeah um okay fantastic uh John we'll uh we'll see you later you gotta go <laughs> okay we'll see you next week um then uh, just before everybody signs off, uh, I just wanted to put out a quick shout out for the further talks that are coming up in August. We haven't released um, a full list yet, but um, next week we are seeing, um, let me just look it up quickly, uh, Emily Woodstrow is talking about, um, shoot, sorry. My I can jump. I can jump in if you want. Please. I'm so sorry. I know what. She, yeah, as if you know. <laughs> I don't have the title, but um, I, I think it's to do with looking at um, black spruce bogs and, and in particular black spruce on on um, forested wetlands as potential old growth species. So she's kind of looking at their age classes. I think that's yeah. the hat. Sorry. Amazing. Thank you. It was, she said something about su successional disruption. It was in the forestry realm. Thank you for taking over. <laughs> so, um, okay, so she is next week. Uh, the week after that, we have uh, Ira Reinhardt smith talking about uh, youth climate uh, activism. Um, and the week after that, we have uh, Lobke uh, presenting on her master's research, um, which I also don't remember, um, but I sent off today. Um, okay, the poster will be released uh, hopefully later on today, and I'll send that out to everybody. So, um, okay, uh, if that's it, then thank you so, so much, Millie. Uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch in the future, and um, thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great Thursday. <laughs>